Thank you, Ayanda. Most definitely, I do believe it is. Uh, and I think we should start from why the free continental trade in Africa is necessary. It is here to make sure that we decolonize the African economies, because most of these African economies, what they did since the 1960s, when supposedly, you know, decolonization happened, they kept most of those legal frameworks that were put together from a legislative perspective by most of these uh, colonizers. And I mean, we only started trading with one another from 2015, but even then there was no integration framework, both from a legal and a economic perspective, that was a guideline for Africans to trade with one another. And I always say that as long as we are not able to trade with each other, as long as we don't have that center of uh, excellence that is allowing us to do that, we honestly cannot be able to trade together uh, with the world. So yes, I believe it is the solution. What's interesting, Dr. Davies, of course, is that trading looks very different now to what it did before the pandemic, a lot of digitization taking place, and that presents very unique challenges for a continent like Africa. How worried should we be about our ability to keep up and the consequences that that might have on our ability to rebound from this pandemic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Ian. Look, my, my real concern is one of economic uh, further marginalization is uh, the, the immediate impact of pandemic. People are talking about deglobalization, disruptive supply chains, and, and that's all very well. But what we've seen, I think there's two factors here. Firstly, the inability of African governments lacking the fiscal headspace to spend money to sort of, you know, support business and support and support um, and protect GDP effectively, unlike advanced economies, what we've seen. I think the second major factor for me going forward is that, you know, I mentioned the word marginalization. Um, clearly, we cannot predict the economics unless until we can predict the behavior of the virus. And that in recent weeks has shown to be practically impossible. So economic certainty can only come about through vaccination programs. Uh, the number of vaccines that African countries have been able to procure so far is absolutely minimal. Even Latin America is significantly far ahead. So I think without these, without mass, uh, well-implemented vaccination programs across across um, sort of uh, across African countries, I feel this disconnect between ourselves will see a further marginalization of the global south effectively, and that's Africa. I think to travel tourism, people will not be traveling, and this will cut off. Uh, I think we'll have like almost like a green passport type system. We currently, as Africans, we travel around the continent, the yellow fever certificates. We'll have a similar certificate for those who've received the vaccine, those who have not. Without, without sort of uh, so-called, you know, vaccine-created herd immunity in those picket countries, we'll see a continuous delay in recovery in travel, tourism, and spend in a particular sector, which is very bad news for, for African economies. So I'm afraid going forward, vaccines are absolute priority number one, not what I'm hearing two, three years sort of time period here. We risk marginalization even further. Yeah. It becomes incredibly difficult, uh, Amgela, to speak about any kind of economic recovery outside of, call it the form of governance that we enjoy or don't enjoy on the continent. Uh, the Ugandan elections come to mind for me. And just, you know, perceptions around the democratic space in Africa. Uh, are we not putting the cart before the horse in some respects by speaking about economic recovery before speaking about the environment that enables that? Uh, I, I totally agree with you, but I just want to first caution us from uh, looking at the free continental trade as deglobalization, because uh, what free continental trade is here to do is to set guidelines by those over 30 rectified uh, countries or countries that have rectified it to say that you as the world, this is how you will do business with Africa. And no more will you do business with us in silos because that has made you to set the rules for us and to be the one that sets our agendas. And I under that has been our biggest problem and totally agree from a governance perspective that at this point in time, the AU is failing Africans with regards to doing that pure oversight of making sure or, or, or the power or the ability of making sure that 
African leaders are accountable to their own people. But at the same time, we can't say that because we've seen this across the world. I mean, the US has just gone through the worst political turmoil, and we've seen this across the world. And we can't say we're giving different rules for Africa that, you know, because we're having these political issues, which I agree we should be solving, then it means that we can't speak about our economic emancipation. At this point in time, Africa has the ability to feed the whole world. But I also uh, agree with what the professor is saying, that with all those resources, unfortunately, as long as we don't have access to technology, because right now only 40% of Africans have access to technology, uh, out of 1.2 billion Africans, we only have 800 million, uh, over 800 million Africans, they don't have access to electricity. So those are the kind of issues that on my side, I see as, uh, as the biggest things that can uh, cause us to struggle to trade with one another. And that's what African leaders need to be looking at. Yeah. And Dr. Davies, it, it does have to be a nuanced conversation, doesn't it? Because the reality is Africa um, is facing the unique challenge of trying to shake off some unfavorable stereotypes. And that's just one way of putting it. I wonder how we can reckon with these dual problems effectively though you know reckoning with our problems but also not allowing those to allow the rest of the world to paint us all with the same brush as the lost dark forgotten continent mm -hmm. look it's um this is a very complex sort of conversation i think me going forward a couple of positives the free trade agenda is arguably one of the most, probably the most ambitious free trade projects since the World Trade Organization in the 1980s. And sort of, you know, good uh, kudos to, to, to African institutions at AU for driving this agenda, particularly at the time in recent years, we've seen a Trump-led sort of trade strategy policy, which has been incredibly uh, disruptive to say the least and, and, and counter to the interests of multilateralism. So that's the first thing. But the, the real thing about the free trade arrangement is is to, to, to build economies of scale. The majority of African countries are, unfortunately, um, tragically, are just too small to matter, I'm afraid. They don't have economies of market scale. We need to integrate these economies to make them more attractive to capital. And that's what the free trade agenda is all about. The real issue, however, is not just about signing legislation, no matter how well-meaning. It's about removing non-tariff barriers, uh, service, in, you know, sort of border infrastructure, an array of very real complex issues. So within five to 10 years, the, the African country of free trade agreement talks about a reduction on tariffs to zero of 90% of traded products. That is very good. We hope to build regional value chains. Deloitte has just done a project World Economic Forum to, re, to be released late, late next week in line, of, uh, in line with the Davos dialogues coming out, of, coming out of Switzerland, is to how do we start to build and consider uh, proactive business government strategies towards more proactive regional value chain creation. And it's a chicken egg situation, which comes first, the deeper manufacturing base or a free trade arrangement. I think they come hand in hand. And for African countries going forward, how do they balance a uh, proactive industrial strategy, not import substitution, but proactive, pragmatic um, industrial strategy with a free trade agenda, which heightens competition and does tend to, to, be, uh, to create increased pressures uh, on domestic business and industry, especially particularly manufacturing. I think the last point for me is, uh, what African states need to do, and again, this talks to your point, is differentiate themselves from other countries in Africa. African countries need to compete for capital, compete for talent. We haven't seen sufficient of that in, in the past, a few exceptions. Think Rwanda, think uh, Ethiopia, et cetera. But I think with the new Biden administration, new stimulus coming, there's a wall of money that potentially can hit emerging markets. Reform is free. If a few countries, South Africa near the top of the list here, are able to do some pretty basic, decent structure reforms, it, we will certainly be rewarded by capital. I think that's the story of 2021 for me of, of certain uh, African countries. Yeah, and, and, and sorry, uh, the, the countries that are getting this right, the countries that are able to distinguish themselves, as you put it, what are they doing enabling them to do that? Um, essentially, what lessons can everybody else learn from what these countries have been able to get right? I think the, the our member countries, countries of first in Morocco, Morocco has become a manufacturing platform to southern Europe, France, and the citizens' policies, favorable tax regime, and obviously geographic location helps as well. 
Secondly, see Rwanda, a, a, a highly, again, uh, geography is against a small country, landlocked Central Africa, bad neighborhood, one can say. But Rwanda has a very, um, a very effective state, a state that's able to deliver key performance metrics for a civil service uh, and very strong commercial, um, commercially minded leadership. That's what we need. And Rwanda standing out. Another country, Ethiopia, of course, major social and even conflict issues in, in recent years and conflict still simmering in, in, in uh, Tigridi region. But what we're seeing here in Ethiopia, the country that's been sort of doubling GDP every seven, eight years because of high GDP growth, driven by infrastructure spend and a more sort of enabling environment for business. And, and again, taking the foot of the throat of private sector uh, capital into Ethiopia, driving growth. Other countries, Mauritius, a small country uh, which has gone from the stereotypical a single commodity exporting African country, think sugar in this case, who diversified uh, tourism, uh, financial services, um, offshore sort of financial management type type business model. So it, it's countries that are able to, 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 again, move away from resources. Resources have very little value. It's about creating, as was said earlier, technology, intellectual capital, is, is, is how do countries you know, create, form, institutionalize, and ultimately lay the foundations for true sustainable growth. There's other examples, Botswana, Namibia, small countries, decent governance moving forward. And of course, you have many others in reverse gear. Ghana is another one, standing out, doing extremely well in recent years, again, because of good political economic management. Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, in very good strides. These are the countries that stand out. The others, I'm afraid, if not standing out and competing, they are in, in economic terms or economic growth terms, I'm afraid, in, uh, in reverse gear. I'm going to very quickly then, uh, you know, Dr. Davies touched on what arguably is the big story of the moment, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, a new presidency in the United States. Do you feel Africa now has a friend in the White House? I hope Africa now has a friend in the White House. I'm always very cautious to be optimistic up until we see the president coming out loudly to undo some of the things that have been done by the pre previous government of the US. Uh, but we're finding another friend with the UK uh, because of Brexit and things having not gone so right for the UK there. And they're looking into Africa as a friend. Yesterday, uh, already we had uh, a UK business uh, and Africa business conference and Prime Minister Boris himself was there and making some big commitments uh, and telling us that, you know, as of uh, already last year, they'd already spent uh, over 800 million pounds uh, in 28 African countries and they're looking at increasing that. And to hear such things, you know, uh, coming uh, from investors uh, and making commitments into African projects during in the midst of the pandemic. Ayanda, it has to tell you that Africa is still seen as the market of choice. And because it has a young population, then it has the ability to grow. But as the doctor is saying, and I'm in total agreement, that there is quite a number of key things that we need to look at. It's an incredibly interesting conversation. Thank you very much for your insights. Uh, Yamkela Makupula is the CEO of uh, Diaz Ruiz Africa. Appreciate your time.